Recording started. All right. Uh, today we're going to continue talking about circulation and immunity to a certain extent. Um, sort of combining two smaller lessons together here. So this corresponds with about 20 lessons uh, 484 to 485. So uh, first of all we want to talk about plasma interstitial fluid exchange. What the heck is that? Okay this is uh, where you have aqueous solutions that compose the plasma and the interstitial fluid. Uh, they're exchanging through the thin walls of the most uh, of your body's capillaries. So the capillaries is, is sort of the semi-permeable membrane that's separating these solutions, your, your plasma and the interstitial fluid, okay, which is the fluid in between the cells. Uh, the forces that govern this exchange are hydrostatic pressure, the blood pressure within the capillaries, and osmotic pressure. Okay, so if you look at the diagram here, you can see that uh, you've got from the arterial end of the capillaries, oxygen is going out, okay, and then it gets in lower concentration. You have carbon dioxide going in. We also have water, you know, the water is going out on this side, but it's going in on this side uh, of the capillary bed, and then goes towards the heart. So, you know, that water will then be filtered by the kidneys or something like that. Um, but you have some of the water coming out to the cells where it's needed as well. Okay, so there's this exchange of fluids and materials, um, you know, the nutrients coming to the cells and the waste going out of the cells, basically. So plasma interstitial fluid exchange is facilitated through hydrostatic pressure, which is the pressure exerted by a fluid on any contacting surface, such as the force exerted by blood on a capillary wall. So hydrostatic pressure is greater on the arterial end of the capillary, and that's why you have uh, materials going out at the capillary end, or at the arterial end of the capillary. But then, because your pressure is lower in the capillary on the uh, venous end, or venule end, you have absorption. Now, osmotic pressure is hydrostatic pressure produced by a solution that is separated by a semipermeable membrane, and it is created due to different concentration of solutes. So it's not just the pressure itself, it's the concentration of solutes that are present in solution. So it is required to maintain equilibrium with no net movement of solvent. In other words, osmotic pressure stays the same at all times unless there's a problem. Uh, you can think of osmotic pressure as the pressure required to prevent water from leaving. So here we have a semi-permeable membrane, and uh, water is going towards the solute. But at some point, you hit this equilibrium where the water going towards the solute is equal to the water going away from the solute, and uh, you know it's going to stay that way. Now, in the diagram to the right, the force exerted by the water inside the capillary will eventually equal the force of diffusion from the interstitial fluid, which will create an equilibrium. This equilibrium, when it is reached, uh, will continue to flow, but it flows in both ways, in equal amounts as well as forces. This is why osmotic pressure remains high over the length of the capillary. Okay, so here you can see the pressure. Uh, you know, is higher in the arterial end than it is in the venous end, so that goes down. The osmotic pressure continues, you know, in one direction or the other direction. Okay, so the osmotic pressure, you see, stays kind of constant. Uh, so it's just the direction that changes. So here you can see this is the direction, you know, out of the capillaries uh, in the one end and then into the capillaries in the other end. So fluid movement is important uh, for all different organ systems, like your, your muscles. You know, the muscles have to get rid of waste products like carbon dioxide. And they have to get uh, nutrients like oxygen and glucose. Um, you know, muscles sometimes might have to get rid of something like lactic acid if they've been uh, sort of functioning in an anaerobic capacity. Respiratory system, you know, you have oxygen going from the lungs into the capillaries in the lungs uh, and carbon dioxide going out into the alveoli and breathed out digestion. Uh, you have absorption of nutrients 
uh, through the lining of the digestive so tract. Uh, so this is fluid movement, water as well, and the secretory system. Uh, and we're going to talk with kidneys a little bit later on in this course, but the kidneys are a prime example, again, of fluid movement where you have waste materials going sort of into the kidneys and uh, being filtered out. Now, cell-mediated immunity. We're going to be talking about uh, the immune system here for a bit. Um, now, I know we, we did discuss it previously, but we're going to sort of focus in on the cell-mediated portion. Now, this involves the activation of white blood cells, specifically macrophages, neutrophils, and monocytes. And we talked about those, uh, I guess, in detail last time. And T cells, rather than the production of antibodies. Okay, so that's what cell-mediated means. But we're going to talk about some of the cells uh, involved here as well. So if you take a look at, you know, the basic format for cell-mediated immunity, you've got the antigen-presenting cell, so some sort of pathogen or virus or bacteria, some bad thing. And it's going to encounter T lymphocyte, which is going to activate things uh, where you have your macrophages. So we talked about your macrophages. Okay, which are going to kill bacteria. Um, it's going to activate your, your killer T cells, okay, and your NK cells. And these will also kill things like tumor cells or virus-infected cells. So let's take a look at our helper Ts. These arise from the thymus, and they recognize an antigen on the surface of an invading pathogen and stimulate B cells to produce antibodies. So that's what we remember, want to remember about helper T cells is they recognize antigens and stimulate B cells to produce antibodies. Now killer T cells, these are also known as cytotoxic T cells. Um, this will kill other target cells such as cells infected with viruses, parasites, or cancer. So any of those types of cells are going to be taken out. Kabam! Bam! I'm going to bust a cap in you. Bam, all of these things are going to be gone uh, due to the killer T cells action. Okay, now these T cells monitor all the cells of the body and are ready to, ready to destroy any cells that express foreign antigen fragments on the surface. So that's pretty important for the killer T cells. Um, and they'll get rid of them. So it's good. You want to have lots of these kicking around because they'll keep, uh, say, cancer cells from developing into tumors and stuff like that. Okay, suppressor T cells, these are, are sort of a regulatory cell because they will slow and suppress the processes of cellular immunity to ensure that normal tissue does not get destroyed. Because if you have, you know, the immune system run amok, it can, you know, start attacking its own tissues, like in autoimmune diseases. Uh, and so the suppressor T cells will... You know, see, everyone calm down. You know, they, they get all of the, the killer T cells, you know, all mellowed out and stuff like that so that you, you don't have this continued uh, aggressive immune response that starts attacking, you know, healthy body tissue. Okay, as long as it's targeted at, at uh, infected body cells and things like that, then you're okay. Okay, memory T cells. These are a lymphocyte that carries receptors for a specific foreign antigen uh, encountered in earlier infection through vaccination, or through vaccination rather. So it quickly promotes an immune response um, if the same antigen is re-encountered in a subsequent infection. So this, these memory T cells are, are responsible for our immune memory. So you get your infection, you have your effector uh, expansion than a memory. So whenever those those cells encounter that same antigen, they will kick in a response, you know, um, very quickly and eliminate that antigen. Um, memory cells respond very quickly to subsequent exposures to antigen. So here you can see the primary immune response was like this. But secondary immune response is like, whoa, a few orders of magnitude larger, okay, and just immediately, bam. Now, some cells um, have over 20 years in their memory, these memory T cells, 
remember the antigen, even 20 years later. So that's pretty cool. Anyway, so this uh, finishes our discussion of circulation immunity. I'm hitting the button.